The existence and uniqueness theorem in differential equations gives us a way to determine whether uh, possibly a solution for a differential equation exists. And if so, is that solution unique? So one of the, the most common um, things that we can approach this from, or ways we can approach this is the idea if we have an equation, we ask, does a solution exist to this uh, equation? Well, the numerical value, if we were to solve this, that we'd get would be x equals negative 4 thirds. So yes, the, a solution exists. Uh, is it unique? Well, this is the only solution that will satisfy this equation. So in this case, the solution is unique as well. However, if we consider something uh, like a quadratic, x squared equals 4, then uh, we, a solution certainly exists, but we, we cannot call the solution unique because we have x equals 2 or x equals negative 2 as solutions. So uh, the theorem allows us to determine whether or not a differential equation whose solutions are actually functions will have a unique solution. So it t tells us that if we have an initial value problem, meaning we have a differential equation, an initial condition, that if, um, the, uh, if dy dt, the differential equation, and the derivative of the differential equation with respect to y are both continuous, um, meaning they're, they're not just, it's not just the case that we can plug in uh, the initial condition and get a, a a defined output, but we have to make sure that that function is continuous surrounding that value of t and surrounding that value of y. So what we're talking about here is making sure that uh, we have a t naught and a y naught such that uh, around that t naught value, I can put a t naught there, and around that y naught value, that around that ordered pair the function is continuous in both directions, in the y and uh, the, the t direction. So how do we visualize this? Well, in this case, here we have a differential equation, and we won't provide the, the, the function here. But let's just say, let's suppose that this is the t-axis, this is the y-axis, and this is the dy dt axis. So what we get is a multivariable function. dy dt is a function of, in this case, both t and y. And uh, while uh, this would require some calculus 3, the value of dy dt changes in both directions. It's dependent on both t and on y. So here we have this function. And now on the t-axis, we have some initial condition in here. We'll just go ahead and say that uh, the initial condition that we want is right there. Oops. So the initial condition is right there. OK, well, that initial condition has some value of t. And that's the value of t. And then it has some value of y, which is that value right there. And then it has some value of dy dt, which is vertically some point along that plane. OK, so in order for um, this theorem to work, I, number one, I've got to make sure this guy is continuous surrounding my initial condition. So this point right here is the ordered pair t naught, y naught, and this pair that we actually would have to travel upwards from the ty plane to, that right there is the value of dy dt for that initial condition. Okay, well as long as t, that point right there is um, between, as long as this function is continuous between some point, which we'll call b, and then some point over here, which we'll call a, in other words, uh, that if, as long as t falls within some interval of continuity for um, uh, a and b, and now a and b are arbitrary, as long as there's a little bit of space in this direction and a little bit of space in this direction along the t-axis for which this function is continuous, then we're fine. And similarly for y, y has to be continuous between some value c and then some bigger value over here, d, which uh, then forms this nice little rectangular region that we see here in the ty plane. Um, not sure why my pen is spiking like that. But uh, as long as this point falls within that rectangle and not, let's say, on the outer edges of that rectangle, so this would be bad, I'll put it in red, anywhere along here would be bad. In other words, we've got to make sure that there's some continuous region surrounding our ordered pair t and y. And it's rectangular because it's, uh, our input is an input two-dimensional plane consisting of the t variable and the y variable. So moving along, we can now um, think about this existence and uniqueness theorem in a, in a number of different ways. So the, the step one is to check uh, whether the differential equation is continuous. So this is step one here. And 
we want to answer the question, is dy dt continuous at the initial condition? If it is, then we move on and we say, okay, step two, and that corresponds to this whole column here. Step two is, if, okay, so if, if yes, dy dt is continuous at the initial condition, is the partial derivative of dy dt continuous with respect to y at the initial condition? If yes, then we conclude in step three that the differential equation has a solution and that solution is unique. However, if we, uh, if we find that dy dt is not continuous, then the theorem is inconclusive. It does not mean that there is not a unique solution. It just means that the theorem doesn't give any insight into that. So we run into a completely useless conclusion here if this happens. However, if the uh, 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 differential equation is continuous at the initial condition, but the partial derivative of the differential equation is not, then, no sol then a, solution, a solution or solutions do exist, but we, we don't know anything about uniqueness. So at least in this case, if we end up here, then we can say that uh, we have existence but uh, uniqueness is questionable. However, if both functions are continuous at that initial condition, then we have existence and we have uniqueness. So let's test this on a couple of quick examples. Uh, here we have the differential equation y squared plus t squared y with the initial condition that, that uh, t naught is 0 and y, y naught is 2. So essentially what we're saying is that we want to see if it's possible to draw a solution to this differential equation, which will be on the, uh, the ty plane. So remember, when we're solving differential equations, what we want to extract is from this rate of how, how, how y changes over time, can I get a sense of how y behaves over time? So uh, not the rate of change in y, but I ultimately want to know what is the value of y at any given time. So I, I know that I am, I'm interested in the initial condition 0, comma 2. And I, I don't know what this thing is going to look like over here, but I want to see, is there a solution for that? Well, dy dt, so this is, this is actually the dy dt axis, and we'll just, say, um, we'll just say that for simplicity this is t, and this axis here, the red one, is y. You can see that going this way. And we can pretty quickly see that this guy is continuous, that it, it's kind of like a, um, I don't know how you describe this, almost like a saddle, and this, is the, this gray part is the ty plane, and we don't really see any discontinuities in this function. Which makes sense, because if I think about this, it's much easier to think about, is the function ever discontinuous? So is there any ty point that won't work? Well, if I think about it this way, if I plug in a y, can I square any value? Well, yes, I can. Decimal, negative, positive, fraction, etc., zero. Same thing here. Can I square any value of t, and then can I multiply it by any value of y? Well, certainly, there's no issue with squaring values, and there's no issue by multiplying by y. So this guy is actually continuous everywhere, and so we have uh, dy dt is continuous. I really care just about this initial condition, but it's actually continuous everywhere because there's no t or y that I could plug into this equation that will produce a dy dt that is undefined. Now I take the partial derivative of this guy, and I'm going to write it as the partial of f with respect to y because another way to write dy dt is f of t comma y. And the partial of this guy is going to be 2y. Now t squared is a constant, so I have constant times y to the first, which is just constant. So plus t squared. And again, I can probably pretty quickly see that there's, can I plug in any ty pair into here? Well, certainly I can multiply any number by 2, decimal, fraction, negative, uh, ratio, whatever, um, a 0. And I can certainly square any number. So df, or the partial of f with respect to y, is continuous. And so what I conclude is that um, this has a unique solution. So in other words, through this ordered pair right here, I'm going to be able to find only exactly one solution curve. Exactly one solution curve that will pass through that. Now, this theorem didn't tell me what that solution curve will look like, but I know that there is one. Another example. Um, here we have dy dt equals the square root of y. And uh, y of 0 equals 0. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Now, um, if, you, if, if you think about this in two dimensions, this uh, graph in two dimensions, if I were just plotting y equals the square root of x, would look very similar, just would not be three-dimensional. Uh, y equals the square root of x would look kind of like this. So that you can kind of see the resemblance from the side, you can see the, the curvature there. Okay, well, now I've got to be careful, because yes, dy dt, I can plug in 0 in 4y, and I get... Uh, 
the square root of 0 equals 0. That's fine. However, y, is, y of 0 equals 0 is that point right there on the plane. So there actually is not a rectangle. That does not fall within a rectangle of continuity because if this is the y-axis, then there is no, the function is undefined for negative y's. So really, if I think about a rectangular region of continuity, that rectangular region would look more like, would more, look more like this. Uh, let's see, there we go. And that point actually falls on the border because of the fact that I can't have negative y values in here. This guy is not considered to be continuous. It's continuous for, for y's greater than 0, but it's not continuous at y equals 0. So dy dt not continuous at y of 0 equals 0. So if we step back a couple uh, pages, we could see that in our theorem, our conclusion would be that uh, the theorem is inconclusive. So no conclusion can be drawn. Uh, whoops. Um, go this way. No conclusion from the theorem. Now we could always try to find a solution by using analytic techniques, but for now we know that there's no conclusion that can be drawn from the theorem. Okay, so consider a, a function like this, dy dt equals y squared plus y. What can be said about the general nature of solutions? Well, first of all, and you, again you can verify this, I can plug in any value of y in this equation that I want. It's not dependent on t, so if you'd like you can write plus zero t there, if that bothers you that there's no t, and certainly I can multiply any number by zero. I can uh, square any number and I can add any number to any number squared. Therefore, dy dt is continuous everywhere. The partial derivative of this is going to be 2y plus 1, which again is also continuous everywhere. This means that each initial condition, ty, has exactly one solution curve that can pass through it. This means that, well, let's go to the, let's go to a, to a next page. If I were to plot uh, t versus y, I know that any initial condition that I can pick let's say that one, has one solution curve going through it. Let's say it looks like that. Well, initial conditions don't have to be limited to ordered pairs 0y. I could say I want my initial condition to be 2, 4. Okay, so when t is 2, we'll say y equals 4 is that point right there. Now there's also exactly one solution curve that passes through that point. So maybe that one looks like that. Okay, well, so what, what happens back here? Let's say this function is decreasing as, as t decreases. Can these two solution curves ever touch? Well, no, they can't, because if, if I pick any ordered pair in this plane, there should only be one solution curve passing through it. So that point right there, which happens to follow along this function, can only have one solution curve passing through it. Similarly, this guy right here, that ordered pair can only have one point passing through it, and this ordered pair can only have one point passing through it, and this point ordered pair can only have one one function passing through it. And same goes for every single ordered pair on the plane. There can only be one curve passing through it. So that means that if I pick a new ordered pair, let's say here, then I know that as time increases, that, that solution curve has to be bound between this solution curve and this solution curve here because of the fact that dy dt and partial of f with respect to y are both continuous that means that every ordered pair has only one solution curve going through it. That implies that no ordered pair can have two solution curves going through it. As a result, two solution curves can never intersect. So if I know that, for example, that I have a function of this nature where the function dy dt and the partial of f with respect to y are continuous everywhere, and let's say I knew that there were two equilibrium solutions, y of t equals 6, and y of t equals 3, and this is uh, a solu two solution curves, and I pick an ordered pair that falls between these two, then what I know is that that solution curve can, now I don't exactly know what it's going to look like, but I know that it can't pass through this equilibrium point or this equilibrium point, so it's actually bound between those two equilibrium points. Similarly, for an initial condition up here, then that function can certainly go upwards, let's say, or a solution curve down here can certainly go downwards, but I cannot have any intersecting curves if dy dt and the partial of f are both continuous everywhere. So to summarize, if dy dt and the partial are continuous everywhere, then no two solution curves will ever intersect. That is one of the most useful parts of this theorem.